Artificial intelligence. Many of you have seen movies about this. This program asks the question, is artificial intelligence the door to the future of our living? Are people using artificial intelligence to get us to do things they want us to do? And are we using artificial intelligence to our advantage? My guests will join me in less than a minute to discuss this. Also in this program, I'll be talking to a woman who as a teenager got involved with the occult and the wonderful things that have happened to her since she gave up being a witch. But first, artificial intelligence. Joining me to discuss this is a man who is no stranger to hundreds of thousands of people who live in New York. Kareem Kamara, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Great to see you. And, and hello to your audience as well. Artificial intelligence is now very real to us. We are involved in this in everyday life, and a lot of us are not even aware of it. Right. So my first question is, what is artificial intelligence and how does it work? Well, as you said, it is artificial, as the name says, and it's basically a machine-based intelligence that simulates human behavior. And so you have to have a basis of human behavior in order for the artificial intelligence to work. You know, for instance, even we look at something like um, when we do a Google search, you know, it's an aggregate of information that's coming together to produce something for us. So artificial intelligence is, is, is similar to that where it is based on human intelligence. And by the same time, as people say, it's going to replace human intelligence. You always need human intelligence, the foundation of that. Uh, so that's what artificial intelligence is in short. And so artificial intelligence, it simulates human behavior thinking, but also it can be trained to solve specific problems. So it's really a combination of what they call machine learning techniques and deep learning. Uh, and so that's the, the basis, the, the short, basic explanation of artificial intelligence is that going to take over our lives well when we say take over our lives so when we look at something like when we look at chat gbt gpt again you know and we've seen some of the things that have happened we saw a picture of the pope with a gold chain on and we saw other things that people thought at first were real we saw Kobe Bryant you know, in a, a video, a Kendrick Lamar musical video that happened. The video was produced about three years after he died. So again, the machine, the, the artificial intelligence will always need a basis of human information to aggregate that information. And so uh, we use chat GBT and we want to come up with an essay. That essay is not coming from native intelligence by chat GBT. It's coming and taking human intelligence and combining it to a form that may not be recognizable to someone who wrote the original essay. Does that make sense? And so I'm optimistic that we'll always need human beings, <laughs> you know, uh, even with that foundation that they have. Uh, we think of the Jetsons, you know, a show that only was on for one season. And the Jetsons had flat screen TVs and automobiles that could operate, you know, uh, in the air. Uh, and things of that nature. People thought that was crazy. That's never going to happen. And look at what's happened. And so the future, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, particularly when we live in a capitalist society that's motivated by uh, by uh, profit, and more profit, and more profit. Uh, and so, but by the same token, uh, that I'm confident that we'll always need human beings for something. Maybe we'll be working for robots, but they'll need us in some capacity. <laughs> You mentioned earlier that um, artificial intelligence is being used by many students to write their papers. And I know lots of professors who are very concerned about that because now they've got to figure out, did this student write this or did they buy it from, from, from some robot? Right, right, right. It's a very real problem. And, you know, I'll tell you, I'll confess, you know, so in marketing, I use, I use uh, content creators, but it's based off of my knowledge. I don't just use something and say, hey, a client wants me to produce this document, the sales copy. 
I don't, I use the artificial intelligence more for research. You know, I have my own writing and I say, you know what, instead of me doing all of this research, it's going to take hours. Let me put the same information in and I can find out, you know, who was the originator of this and who had this product first and who came up with this, this, that, et cetera, et cetera. And so it can be a very valuable tool, but it can be very uh, dangerous for our education system uh, is what you're saying. If we have students that are not developing their own knowledge, but just using artificial intelligence, because guess what? They're using artificial intelligence, but they're basing it off of something someone else wrote at some time in the past. So if they wrote it, you can learn how to write on that same level yourself. Well, students are using it. Yes, uh, yes. Are, are teachers using it to teach? That's another question. And uh, will there be employees in the stores once employers start using artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very scary proposition. As I said, we live in a society that's based off of, you know, it's, a, uh, it's capitalism on steroids. And so if corporations can find a way to replace individuals, and replace that individual with a machine and make more profit because you don't have to pay the machine once it's built, they will. But that also goes back to educational system why it's important for us to have critical thinkers because we have people that are critical thinkers who can first of all come up with their own uh, job or entrepreneurs or who are still needed in the workplace because again, the machine's not thinking for itself. It's basing it off of human input of data, human input of content in order for it to work. Um, but yes, you know, and we already see now, uh, you know, when you look at a store like Target, where you don't really need anyone to check them out. You go and you check yourself out, you do everything you know, and they still have some people there, but eventually they say, hey, you know what, let's cut down on the human beings we have checking people out. Let's rely on the machine and just have one or two pe people. So yes, that's a scary proposition. That's something that uh, we have to prepare ourselves for. That's something uh, why we need uh, governments in place to make sure that we have laws that uh, that allow for technology to take place for us to grow in terms of our knowledge, but also to be there for uh, human beings. You use the term entrepreneurs early. Mm -hmm. How can our youngsters, and by youngsters before, you know, pre-11 or 12, pre-18, 19, pre-30, how can people use artificial intelligence to their own advantage? And I mean to be useful in, in a way that does not destroy people's lives. Right. So how do they use it? Those people who want, young people want to be entrepreneurs, how do they use it? How do they talk about how they can use right. it? Okay, yeah. So I'll, so if I was, per se, if I was 12 years old and I wouldn't, I'm, or 13 or 14 or whatever age, and I was starting a business. The first thing I would do is I would find out, I could use artificial intelligence, say, uh, what are the fastest growing types of businesses, right? And what are the top 10, what are, what are 10 years from now or five years from now, what are going to be the most in-demand services? And I say service because service is something that you can pretty much, as long as you know how to do it, you can pretty much do it right away as opposed to having a product. So. If I was going to start a business, I would find out what are the best service businesses as opposed to what are the best products. Because yes, I can find out how to make a great chocolate chip cookie, but I can also find out, you know, uh, some other service I can provide to people who are chocolate chip cookie bakers, so to speak. And then from that point of finding out what that service is, you can use artificial intelligence to do a business plan, you know, and you can put in a question, whether it's chat GBT or many of the other uh, artificial intelligence creators and say, uh, what are the most in-demand cookies in the United States? You know, what are what cookies sell the most in New York State? And so you can use it as a research process, as opposed to, as opposed to spending, you know, hours and hours. You can with an hour find out the basics of what you need for your business, and then you can go on uh, with that whatever that product or that service is. And so it can be a very valuable tool because it's more than a Google. It's, yes, it is in a sense a type of Google search but you go into data that's even deeper, you know, than just a traditional Google search. So that's what I would use it for. And then you can write a business plan. You know, you can write your business plan. Mm -hmm. What are the, what, what sections do I need for my business plan? Then once you have the sections, then you can say, okay, 
how do I write an executive summary? And you put in your basic information and then the rest comes out. And so it could be very valuable for someone uh, who is an entrepreneur to expedite, not to do all the work for you, but to expedite the process of doing a business plan, starting with off your own information and then taking it uh, from there. That answer, that makes sense. Yes, you talk about expediting the process. Um, yeah. We hear a lot now about driverless cars <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, using right. artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think in terms of, I, I don't know about driverless. You know, I, I, I like some of the cars now where they can sense a car close to them or they can sense you going over into another lane and they adjust. Uh, but I, I just can't imagine a driverless car. You know, as I said, if the artificial intelligence based on human intelligence, am I going to trust that car to operate all the time? Now, part of it is, yes, human beings driving late, you know, at night or et cetera, et cetera. It's a good safety mechanism. Uh, but the prospect of cars not needing a driver behind it, you know, that's something that I think that we're a, a, a ways from. Even if we have the technology, I think we'll be a ways away from that. And we have to see what that looks like. I get lots of emails every day uh, from people pretending to be someone. Um, and that's dangerous. Uh, I had a friend who called me two days ago and said, she's getting these emails from Sam Tate. And I said, did you check to see who it really is from? Uh, she really did not. How, how would you advise persons to be careful about this? Because lots of people are falling victims to these scams. Absolutely. Uh, not just not just people pretending to be someone else, but businesses sending information to you. Right, right. Well, that's the challenge is that with AI, you can create what's called a deep fake. You know, a deep fake is uh, someone who... Uh, you know, who is an online representation of. So they can be an online representation of Sam Tate. And I can create a Facebook page and I can create a phone number and I can create an Instagram page and I can start messaging people from there. The other thing a deep fake does is it finds out about people's online behavior. And so with the online behavior, they can get a sense. For instance, I would, one thing I would tell people right away in terms of what you're saying is don't have a password that's something like your birthday, or something that people that's obvious or your password, your daughter's name is Tracy and your password is Tracy 2023, you know, something like that. Because what people do with the deep fake is they start, they can get a sense uh, through uh, machines, you know, in terms of this similar to the chat GPT, they, they can get a sense of even the Google searches and things of that nature. They can get a sense of your behavior they can get a sense of uh, you know, who your brothers and sisters are. And they can create a Facebook page with images of this or your, your husband or your wife and things of that nature. And once they do that, they can start communicating to more people. And then they have a better way of finding out what someone's password is. You know, a lot of time when someone's their Facebook account is hacked or Instagram, people have been watching them for a while and studying them and finding out ways uh, to continue guessing passwords that may work based on uh, their behavior. And so if I'm an individual, I would say, make sure your, your online accounts are password protected. Make sure you have a way to have verification. Like, so if you're logging into your account, you should have it set up that there's a, a secondary verification through your, through your email or through your phone number. So if someone's logging in. And I just happened to me uh, about two weeks ago, I had within two days, I kept getting a message from Facebook. Are you trying to change your password? Fortunately, I have it set to come to my, so someone was apparently trying to hack into my social media accounts, but because I had the verification on it from by Facebook and through their security protocols, I was getting the message, right? And so have a super secure password and make sure you have verification mechanisms. So whether it's a uh, you know, social media account or the business accounts, then they're reaching out to you directly to verify that you're trying to log in. We've been reading a lot about robotic dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, what, what do these dogs look like? I saw some pictures of them and uh, <laughs> it looks like a machine. I, I haven't seen them yet. I haven't seen a robot. I've heard about it. I haven't seen them, but for God's sake, a dog's supposed to be man's best friend. And, and if you're going to get a dog, get a real dog. How can a machine dog give you companionship like a 
like a, a real, you know, poodle or collie or German shepherd. I just don't get it. That part is that I'm a dog lover. So it's hard for me to get my mind around that one. You are a pastor. Do you see, <laughs> do, do you see uh, a robotic pastor? Well, I mean, if, listen, if you can have a robotic dog, you know, no disrespect to my, my, my friends or pastors or myself, but it may be easy to come up with a robotic pastor than a robotic dog, right? Because <laughs> you have somebody mimicking a human being and giving a message, just like we talked about, that type of thing as well. But I don't, I, just like with the, the dog, I think that there may be, um, you know, churches who have a pastor giving an online message, but because of the faith community, and there's so much more than the faith community than just the message that I believe that, you know, whether someone's a pastor or a rabbi or imam, religious leaders, that they'll still, still be there because I really don't think that a robot will be able to replace that human compassion. You have moved from being an elected official um, and now you're in digital marketing. Yes. What do you do in digital marketing? Well, I do, I'm called what's called a full stack marketer, where I do everything from website creation. Uh, I do copywriting. I do digital advertising. If someone wants to advertise their products on Facebook or Google or YouTube or Instagram, I do that. I do copywriting, which is sales writing. And so I do every facet. Most of my work now is with home-based businesses. And that's because I really think that both home-based businesses, meaning, you know, you're a plumber, you're an electrician. Uh, you know, uh, that's a home-based business and small businesses, those are really the heart of our economy. And so since you know, I was a local elected official, I really have a heart for local businesses. And so most of the work, even though we do offer services for large businesses, corporations, uh, we really put a special emphasis on reaching out to small businesses who need that extra uh, marketing to help them go to the next level. Talk to our young people about how they should use AI. Right. So young people use AI to excel at whatever you're doing. And so if you are, as a, as a student, use AI, yes, use AI to help you do research, continue to write your own papers, develop your writing skills, and use artificial intelligence as a tool to expedite that work. So now you don't have to go to the library and pull out the encyclopedia and you can do a Google search, but now you can also use AI to help you by whatever your topic is, finding out who the experts are in the field and compiling something uh, together to what they said, but continue to grow, continue to use your work. Remember, it's artificial intelligence. Use your spiritual intelligence and emotional intelligence, your intellectual intelligence as the basis, as the foundation, but use artificial intelligence to expedite that, to make your work easier. And don't do like some cyber criminals are doing, using it to take advantage of other people. That's right, do not use it for that. Please do not use it for nefarious means, use it for good, use it for the good of society, the good of your life. Uh, and the good of whatever you oh, are. Others you're, as well. Others, yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Kareem Kamara, we want to thank you for being on Brooklyn 45. Thank you and, for having uh, It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we know we're going to be seeing lots of you now in the digital world, and we'll be seeing more of the real you yes, <laughs> rather absolutely. than an artificial you. <laughs> It'll be me. <laughs> It'll be me showing up at the meetings. It won't. It won't be. A, it won't be an artificial intelligent version of me at a community board meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for being on Brooklyn Forty Five. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Mary Fernandez. Welcome to Brooklyn Forty Five. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Your book, From the Cauldron to the Cross, is such an interesting book, uh, with an interesting story of a journey that you've been through and our viewers are going to be delighted to hear about this journey. So we begin with, on the back of the book, you have this book talks about how an American born college student got involved in the occult. Talk to us about that. A lot of times when we think about Santeria, Espiritismo, Palo Mayombe, the, the 
occult religions that I was involved in, people don't necessarily associate it with people in their 20s in the United States in college. Um, they might think, they might associate it perhaps with people in a third world country and maybe people of an older generation. So that's where that came from. You said you were involved in a lot of things. What are some of those things that you were involved in, in the occult? So I was involved in Espiritismo. I was involved in Palo Mayombe, which is like the cousin of Santeria. And I was involved in Santeria. Now, a lot of us English-speaking persons <laughs> don't know about those and can't translate those uh, into English. Um, you said that there were factors that sent you into this devil's cauldron. Um, devil's cauldron? I'm pronouncing it correct. No. What are some of those factors? Well, some of the factors were um, things having to do with ancestry, which some people call sins of the father. For the purpose of this book, we've called it generational curses. Some of the things um, that also led me to it are soul wounds. I think the culture definitely played a part in it and, um, and trauma. Do you want to talk about some of the trauma that you've been through? Um, in your book, you talk about generational trauma. Yes. What's that generational trauma? Generational trauma is like trauma that is inherited um, through the generation. So slavery could be an example of it. The Holocaust could be an example of it. But it doesn't have to be um, something historical historically removed. It could also be things as um, domestic violence in the home, addiction in the home. All of those things could be, they can influence the behavior of generations to come. And what influenced your decision to get involved in, uh, I suppose many English speaking people will call it witchcraft. Is that the same? Um, yes, witchcraft is, I, I would say witchcraft is like a generic term, right? Um, but it, yeah, I think it all falls under the same thing, like divination. Mm -hmm. And just for clarity's sake, all the different countries have it. They just have like different terms for it. Um, but every, but yes, the, the, the countries where, um, well, actually all the countries, <laughs> They all have different terms, but there's witchcraft in every single continent. You are a psychotherapist. That is correct. What do you do as a psychotherapist? I do individual therapy with adults at the moment, 45 minute sessions. Okay. And in your book, you talked about a rejection of failed relationships. What were these failed relationships? Well, one of them that I talk about, I guess the one the one that I talk about the most would probably be I was married before my current marriage. I got married while I was um, a college student. And so the heartache that came from that relationship, that's actually what drove me to get safe. That's what set up the stage for my conversion story. Uh, you talked about getting saved. That's the cross. Talk to us about what led you to the cross. And uh, talk about the cross for a lot of people who may not understand uh, what is the cross, the call from the cauldron to the cross. There's like this big black pot that the witches have in all the cartoons. That, that's a cauldron. Calderon, right? Like a, a caldero in Spanish. Um, and so in the witchcraft that I practice, we actually use that. And then when I say to the cross, it's like how I went from my pagan practices and then I got saved, which means that I turned my life over to the Lord Jesus Christ, who became my Lord and Savior. And you burned a lot of things in your book on page 39. You related the burning of a lot of objects that you use uh, to acts. Uh, what is that? Acts. Uh, 
19, 19, when they talk about people who practice sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. What did you burn? I had altars, witchcraft altars, in um, the closets. So we took all of the things down. So in my particular case, there was um, candles, incense, potions, things with like cinnamon, idols, statues of idols, pictures of idols. And so those were some of the things that were burned. And you are now a Christian. What message would you like to leave to people who are listening? One of the messages that I would like to leave is that I'm living proof that there is out that there is life once people leave these um, the witchcraft because part of the things these are like kind of like the the similarity to like gangs and stuff like that and mafia like that people it's kind of like people believe like once you leave you will be killed so I I want to make sure that people know that. Jesus is powerful enough. His blood is enough. And once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's life. There's life everlasting. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit. So basically, there is life. And if God was able to save me, a witch, he's able to save anybody. That's definitely one of the things that I want to leave people with. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mary Fernandez, I want to thank you for being on Brooklyn 45. Uh, and your book again, From the Cauldron to the Cross. And we heard about that cauldron and we heard about the cross. I want to thank you very much for being our guest on Brooklyn 45. Thank you so much for having me. We thank you for watching this program and we invite you to partner with Brooklyn 45. You can do this in many different ways. We are a 501c3 community television program. And when you support us with a gift, you benefit and our communities benefit from our programs. So please tell your family, your friends, your colleagues to watch Brooklyn 45. You can watch our programs here on cable television and you can also watch our programs on YouTube. So please support us and be a part of what we do. On behalf of our Brooklyn 45 team, I'm Sam Tate. Brooklyn 45 is a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we welcome your support. Check out our website, brooklyn45.com, and feel free to donate or share it with your friends and family. Have any comments or questions? Send them to our Facebook, facebook.com slash brooklyn45tv. If you have any questions or topics you think we should cover next, shoot me an email over at brooklyn45tv at gmail.com. Thank you again for watching.